All right, we're talking about the church today, and uh, church come, it's in all shapes and sizes. We, we live in a unique part of the world here in uh, Collin County where they do come in all shapes and all sizes and all flavors, we'd say. Uh, in, in my interactions with folks, people say, now I'm calling, uh, some of you have had this experience talking to me on the phone on a Sunday afternoon or an evening where we talk about what it means to visit our church and ask questions and people will say to me, I've never been a part of a big church before and I just don't know what this is going to be like and this is kind of overwhelming and I come from a small church and uh, it's kind of, I, I don't know how to handle this and the next person I talk to will say, I've never been a part of a uh, a small church before and I'm curious because we live in a mega church environment up here in North Texas where there are huge churches around us and both perspectives and I, I heard something helpful years ago and from a pastor of a very large church and he said the thing about church is that if you're a fairly social person I mean you're kind of outgoing kind of person and pretty faithful to your church you'll probably know about 150 people by name. I mean, they'll know you, you'll know them. And on any given, and you're there for a while to build that kind of uh, 150 people. And on any given Sunday, you'll have a personal interaction. If you're pretty outgoing and you're working at it, you'll have a personal interaction with 50 of them. So you'll know 150, you'll have a personal interaction with 50. And if there are 150 people in your church, you'll probably know them all. And there are 15,000 people in your church, you'll probably still know 150 people and you'll have personal interaction with 50 of them on any given Sunday. So that, that's pretty consistent with just how, how, uh, how much socialization you can do on a Sunday with a group of people. Church gets shrunk down when we get people into groups and that's why we're organized the way we are, to group people well. Uh, and that is an unusual thing for church in our area. A lot of churches go big with the the Sunday morning is the, the only thing. Uh, if people get into groups, they talk about it, and that's okay, but it's not a priority for a lot of churches in our area. For us, it is the highest of priorities to group folks up, to get it into smaller groups where somebody knows your name, knows your face, knows your story. And for us, that's how we approach it. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But that makes us different than a lot of churches. And that's what I want to tell you is I want to talk about some distinctives about us. It's not, we're not the only people who do this the way we're, I'm going to describe it. But it's different than the way a lot of people do it. They call themselves church. So we're going to try to break this out this morning just a bit. We've been talking about being rooted. And by the way, next Sunday, Jimmy Smith's going to kick off a new series for us. We're, we're looking forward to called Character Under Construction things that really we've been talking about what it means to be rooted in Christ and rooted uh, to grow and develop there's some things about character that are developed in certain ways that God uses to his glory and for our good we're going to look at those things over the next few Sundays rooted and this is a weird aberration in the life of church it's a lot different than it's ever been before and it is this that a lot of people are free agent Christians I'm a Christian I'm just not tied to a church I love Jesus I just don't like church you know why because people are at church people are hard to like they're difficult and so that's where it starts breaking out so we have a lot of people and it's a multi-generational issue that I just want to slide in slide out I want to remain anonymous and there are plenty of places around here where you can, it's a big crowd and you can be anonymous. And you can be anonymous here. Slide in, slide out. Nobody knows you. You don't know them. And you can stay. That's not how God designed the Christian life to be lived. And that's not how we grow by, we grow through relationship. We grow relationship to God, relationship to other believers. And we have to learn to be good at that. Now let me tell you about First Baptist Church Allen. We are... By the way, the baseline to this in your program today, key to growing spiritually, key to developing fully as a follower of Christ, not just, I like this part of the Christian life or this part of the Christian life, and I'm just going to do that. To be a part of the whole fully developing follower of Christ thing, you have to be a part of a body of believers, a group of believers going through life together, a church. 
So our sign out front says First Baptist Church. Have you noticed the sign? First Baptist Church. Because we're creative church namers in Baptist life is why we come to that. Because we were the first Baptist church in Allen, Texas. And uh, there's, a, there's a whole set of Presbyterian churches in Philadelphia. And there's a sixth, Baptist, a sixth Presbyterian church. That's the worst marketing in the history of Christianity right there. To you come up with something else. You know, Grace or Calvary. Give it another name than just, uh, just numbering them off one by one. So this church has been here for uh, this year. It'll be 141 years at this spot. And uh, First Baptist Church, FBC. How many, uh, for my curiosity, we've done this periodically. It's been a while. How many of you did not grow up in a Baptist background church? Yeah. And that is pretty typical. In fact, often it, the majority of our people when I've done that survey, did not grow up in a Baptist world. So I want to help you understand that world a little bit and what may be a little bit different about it. It's definitely, in my opinion, not the beginning and end of all things. Here's why, because we say Baptist, but you know there are over a hundred different kinds of Baptists just in the United States. And many of them, you look at them and you'd say, that doesn't look anything like any Baptist I've ever seen before. Because the wide range of what it means to be uh, Baptist, in just, that's just in our country. We just happen to be a part of the largest association of those Baptist churches, Southern Baptists, which that is not a description of our geography. That is a description of just, that's the name of the group that we're a part of. And they're all over the country and they range far and wide into the ends of the earth. That's just a simple part of it. But I want to talk about today is uh, kind of basic things about this church, this expression of a Baptist church. And there's some unique things about that that a lot of people have found in talking about this over a lot of years now don't understand. And I want you to be able to understand it for yourself, especially those of you who are looking for a church home. And those of you who are having this conversation out and around and all over to be able to talk to other people about it effectively. So our, our Baptist church is a part of a denomination. We talk about denominations. There are Methodists and there are Catholics and there, there are Lutherans and, and there are Baptists and all these different variety of groups. So as a Southern Baptist, that's, that's a denomination. It's a gathering of people. And so we relate to some Baptist churches in Collin County. We have an association with them. We, ha we relate to Baptists statewide and association with them things we do together and we relate to Baptists nationally and there are things we do together in the class I break out some of those details of what those things are but ultimately it just comes down to we, we get together because we need the support that we're not in this alone partnership has a lot of advantages and fellowship has some good advantages when we get together as churches and do stuff together because there are things that our church is a fairly large church but there's a lot that we're going to be in over our heads if we try to take it on by ourselves. But we partner up with other churches. There are a lot bigger things that we can do. We can, we, our reach goes much further when we, we join hands with other folks. Uh, one of the things about, about this church and Baptist world, see, in churches, there's usually something that looks like that in organizational structure. Just about every body that calls themselves church has a, pyramid kind of thing that says okay at the top of that pyramid is some individual or some group of individuals uh, some committee some something and they are in charge and they tell everybody downwind here's what you're going to do here's how you're going to do it here's what you're going to be they're the authority over all those other churches and most everybody's organized that way except for us Baptists and we're not that whole thing gets flipped because in Baptist life it's all about the local church we choose to relate to a denomination but that denomination doesn't tell us how much money to send them or what we can and can't do or what our budget's going to be all that's decided right here in First Baptist Church Allen, Texas which makes us a lot different than a lot of other groups that are out there here's some key things about us 
not the beginning and end of all things uh, but these are key things that I sure want you to understand so as an autonomous we are in the it's us chickens right here at First Baptist Church Allen Texas uh, I want you to understand how that works so here's the first thing about how that works we believe Jesus has all authority and his word the Bible is our authority for all we do we're going to come back to the Bible over and over and over again and if it's in here or if it's in a group it's going to come back to the Bible our authority is the word of God one of my favorite statements about God's word is the Bible was written over several centuries by men divinely inspired by God maybe a couple of women it has God as its author salvation for its end and truth without any mixture of error for its matter it is authoritative in all matters of life all matters of church life it tells us what we do and it tells us what we don't do we believe in the word of God and that just changes a lot of worldview and that decide that that clarifies a lot about what's important to us and what's not and it just makes it clear this is right and this is wrong in our world the Bible is our authority and that's who we're going to be priesthood of believers the Bible teaches every Christian has direct access to God through Jesus Christ our mediator our Savior and you don't need you don't need me or your Sunday school teacher or a deacon or some other spiritual authority figure for you to talk to God doesn't he talk to God on your behalf you, you have direct access to God we are a kingdom of priests in the body of Christ however in that context there's a whole lot of privilege to priesthood of believers a lot of privilege and a lot of responsibility because you know what that means I'm not the only guy that's supposed to do stuff how about that you have responsibilities as a priest you serve you participate you're part of the team you're part of the organization you're not just watching someone else do it your Sunday school teacher your deacon uh, you are you're in the game and everybody serves that's why we had our uh, focus on connecting with ministry a couple weeks ago because everybody needs to have them everybody serves everybody is in the game then autonomy the local church now we we value associating with other people in our church we'll associate with uh, our denominational organizations and we we've, we've done some of that this week but there are a lot of people who believe the same things we believe but they're not called a Baptist there are organizations that are not our denominational structure organizations We'll, we'll partner with anybody who helps us accomplish the mission God's given us in the Bible because the Bible is where we're always going to go back so we'll partner with a lot of different folks to help us do what we do there's value in cooperating but we recognize for us every local church is self-governing independent from denominational control and we determine our own strategy structure and style right here we're in the process of budget planning so our staff we submit here's where we think God's leading us and we do a lot of staff led stuff at our church but there are church elected committees that give input into that that help us to help direct that that hold us accountable for that we're accountable for every penny that comes in and comes out and there there are groups that are elected by the church to to monitor that and keep an eye on it. we have lots of checks and balances and accountability in our structure as an autonomous church we have to, to do our very best to be above board at everything and uh, above question in how we do it the church we we met Wednesday night we meet once a ever three months for a quarterly church conference At that point we just roll it here's our financial statement if you want to see one between now and next time we're glad to let you have one here's every penny that came in here's every penny that went out here's exactly where we are financially and it's all on a piece of paper that's we made the print bigger this time so that it's even easier for an old guy like me to see and we, we want to be above board everything is out there the church votes on big stuff and the biggest thing the church votes on is the budget and that's coming around in March so we're in the budget preparation process we vote on our budget in March it goes into effect in April 
we vote on the budget because it's our ministry plan for the next 12 months, which makes the budget a big deal because it says this is what we believe God's leading us to do in the year to come, and we're going to do our very best to handle well what's been entrusted to us for the mission God has entrusted to us. I want to share two passages of Scripture with you. Both of them are from uh, Matthew because I want to make it easy on you. There's one that's noted in your program in Matthew 28. There's another one that's in Matthew 22. And I'm going to read the one in Matthew 22 first. I encourage you to open your Bible to the gospel according to Matthew. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is the first book in your New Testament. Genesis is the first book in your Old Testament. And I hope you're reading through your Bible because the Bible is our authority for everything we do. So it's a good idea to be in that Bible and spending time in God's Word to see what He has to say to you and what He has to teach you. This is Matthew 22, beginning in verse 36. And this is a big deal because Jesus says, both of these statements are things Jesus said so clearly. The first is called the Great Commandment. Jesus, teacher, they call Him. Which command in the law is the greatest? I mean, out of all of it, what's the biggest, the, the most important? And he said to them, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and the most important command. The second's like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. You just, you just can't step past that. We're going to love God, the vertical relationship, and we're going to love one another, the horizontal relationship. That's what it means to be a part of God's people. And that sums up everything that's going to happen in the Old Testament, most of the New Testament. Then, there's another big sweeping statement. Uh, we get it in multiple places, each of the Gospels in the book of Acts. But the most familiar to most of you, and because I'm still in Matthew, Matthew 28. This is the last thing Jesus says before he is ascending back into heaven which makes it a pretty big deal. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. And there's a whole lot of good and a whole lot of challenge in that thing we call the Great Commission. So the Great Commission, the Great Commandment. And when I think about church, I want you to think about church this way. Uh, I really believe with all my heart that a great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission will grow a great Christian. And I think it'll grow a great church. And so we're going to seek to be a church that has an intense focus and a great commitment to those two big sweeping statements. And that's going to give us plenty to work on until we go, we go to be with the Lord or He comes for us. Now, when thinking about who we are as a church and some basic things about us, some of you may say, well, I never knew I, why I went here till now. Others of you will say, I don't know why I'm going here now. Well, we're going to clarify that. We want to sort things out for you. FBC, so First Baptist Church, easy enough. And that's what the sign says. That's what the letterhead says and all that. Hey, I want you to think about FBC because this will help you to outline uh, what we're about to talk about. When you think about FBC, here's a way for you to remember it so you can convey it to other people. That letter F, faith in Jesus Christ. That's going to be a key part of who we are as a church, faith in Jesus Christ. Now, here's, uh, here's what we believe as a church. This is, uh, these are big things. This is doctrine of salvation stuff. It's not the beginning and end of all things doctrine of salvation. I'm just going to give you a pretty good handle on it. We believe salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. You know why we believe that? The Bible tells me so. Thank you. Because that's, that's what the Bible says. And what's our authority? The Bible. By grace through faith. Salvation is a, by grace. God, God offers it not because we earned it, not because we deserved it. He offers it up to us as a, as a free gift. Purchased at the high price of the sinless Son of God dying on a cross for our sins in our place, taking our punishment we deserved, and then He was raised from the dead. 
And because he was God, because he was perfect, what he did at the cross paid everything that needed to be paid. He assured us that what he did, did everything that needed to be done to secure for us our relationship to God, our sin debt wiped clean, and to know that one day we can have eternity in heaven. That's the grace is offered up. We have to respond to it, and we respond to it by faith. And faith is just saying, as God, God reaches out to us and says, I want to give you this gift, faith is just accepting the gift God so freely and generously, graciously gives to us. We believe Jesus is the Son of God who died on the cross, raised from the dead, and we, we surrender our lives to Him. Now, one of the things that's going to make us different than a lot of Christian groups, so-called Christian groups, and I'm going to challenge the word Christian in these, in these groups, is we believe this. And this is how we're going to teach it here. We believe in the exclusivity of Christ. Now that's a big old word. But here's what it means. Jesus is the only way. He is not one of the options. It's not, well, there are a lot of different ways up the mountain. You've heard that, I've had that conversation multiple times. Well, you know, this religious group goes up this side. And this religious group goes up this side. And this religious group goes up this side. When we get to the top, we find out we all were just believing the same thing. There's only one problem with that. You're an idiot if you believe it because, and I say that in love, because you've never studied world religions. Because the only person who can say that is someone who is oblivious to what other religions believe. Because here's the deal. The paths are so, they're, they're directly opposite each other. They're not heading in the same direction even close. They are spiraling off in all kinds of ways. The mountain itself is not the same in those world religions. And when you get to the top, it's not even the same God. Dramat if, you, if you talk to the other world religions, they'll say, oh goodness, no, we don't believe the same thing. We're light years apart. All you have to do is study world religions, you'll discover they're all different. Here's the thing. We believe Jesus is the only way of salvation. The reason we believe that is because Jesus said it. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. There is only one way. Jesus is not an option. It is not Jesus plus, Jesus or, Jesus and. It is Christ and Christ alone. And so that's how we're going at this. And that's not a pride deal like, ah, oh, we're the only people that ever figured this out. And everybody else is a nut. Even if it is true. Here's, here's, why, here's what that does. It ought to drive us to get outside the walls of here to tell people the story because we've got to have a burden for the losses of the people around us. And we've got to engage people who are far from God who just have never had opportunity. In Allen, Texas, we find every week people who have never had the opportunity to say yes to Jesus, to understand a biblical gospel. Grace through faith. Now, here's, here's the other part, and this, this touches on several things. Uh, most people are trying to pay for their own sins. They're going to try to live a good life or be really religious and they'll earn their way. And they'll pay for their own sins. You can pay for your own sins. You can spend eternity in hell separated from God and pay for your own sins. Back to the Bible thing. This is what I want to point back. If you find a church that says they don't believe in hell, you found a church that somewhere along the way said we don't believe the Bible. It's usually the first thing that people drop out. Before they drop out what God says about a lot of other big, big issues, when that one drops out, everything starts to fall by the wayside. And so you'll find, well, they, they're probably going to give way on a lot of things. The exclusivity of Christ is going to come pretty close after hell disappears from their theology. Uh, so that, that's just a clarifier in uh, evaluating the places you go and who you partner up with. Now, I want to tell you this. I think about hell. Uh, I can talk about hell because the Bible talked, Jesus talked more about hell than he did heaven. So I can talk about hell. But you know what? If I don't have a little bit of a tear in my eye when I'm doing it, uh, I'm really missing something because uh, as a believer in Christ, I got to have a burden for people. I don't want anybody to go to hell. Here's the, here's the other part. That is not God's heart or God's plan for anybody. God, God wishes none should perish, but all should come to repentance. God's intention, for God so loved the world that he, in, this, in this way, 
He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Our relationship to God is not restored by anything we do. It is based upon what Jesus has already done for us. Here's the second thing about this doctrine of salvation. We're going to teach it this way. We believe we are saved for good works, not by good works. And most people, honestly, most religious groups, most people who are even going to call themselves Christian, it's, it's works-based. It's based on what I do, the religious things that I, religious boxes I check. That's how people are, are, are thinking they're, they're going to get there. That's how the Pharisees did it in the New Testament. It's how most religious groups in the world still do it. You just try to do all the right stuff and... We can't earn this. It is a gift of God. Uh, so I, I don't serve God or do acts of obedience to God in order to earn my salvation. I, I serve God and I seek to obey Him because I am His and He is mine. Because I gave my life to Jesus. And, and it flows out of that relationship of love as He has loved me. Uh, so it's uh, not by works lest any man should boast. A, I've given you verse references on these Ephesians 2, 8 and 10, 8 through 10. We believe our relationship to God is secure in Christ. Forgiveness and eternal life are a gift from God made possible by Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. If you have given your life to Christ, you have, you have put all your faith in Him, you've surrendered your life to Him, you can't like... I'm going to heaven today, and tomorrow, well, I messed up, so now I'm not going to heaven anymore. Because I can't undo what Jesus did for me at the cross. It's not based on what I do anyway. It's based on what he did. And so here, here's, what you, here's what you get with this. Any group, and it's really the majority of Christian groups believe you can lose your salvation. Every one of those, if they believe they can lose their salvation, there's also something in their theology that says they have to earn it. You put all your faith in Jesus Christ, your personal Savior. Oh, and be baptized. Like, who controls baptism? Man, the church controls baptism. So who determines who gets saved? The church? Well, that just doesn't quite add up. You start adding things to it, you're going to end up with a theology of works and if you're based on works, absolutely we're going to fail and falter. And it would be that fragile. But my salvation is not based on me. It's based on the eternal work of Christ at the cross and the resurrection. And that is all insecure. We believe we can't undo the work of the cross. Salvation secure in Him. That is letter F, faith in Christ. Second thing, belong in community. Now, we, we spent... Uh, our Sunday last week talking about this I'm going to hit a few things as well here because this is a big deal we believe in grace filled community and what that means is we come together like this and some of you people are hard to love in fact if you're sitting next to one of those people why don't you just point it out say, you know sometimes you just go ahead and turn to the person next to you and say I love you man you're kind of hard to love you probably sit with your family so Jimmy's got uh some marriage enrichment things coming up and uh, re-engage is starting so uh, you'll be able to work on your marriage that just blew up. <laughs> Christ followers grow best in the context of committed relationships to one another. Everyone should look out not only for his own interest but also for the interest of others. In our context, and I know there, there are a lot of churches that Group stuff is not even on the radar. If it is, there, there are churches around here that run way into the thousands that if they can get 5 to 10, 10%, they're doing handstands. 10% of their worship population in a group, it's awesome. We would be, I would be ashamed at our place. We run even with group and worship. Sometimes group is bigger, thanks to our preschoolers. Uh, we, we group we group hard we, we want that to be who we are because we think you grow best and you take care of each other best that's where you make friends I have these conversations you know Chad I think we're going to have to find a new church we just we just don't know anybody we don't feel connected and so what group are you a part of well I'm not a part of a group oh, oh so you were counting on that 30 second meet and greet time to be the end all of building relationships at First Baptist Church Allen well we need smarter members than that so I'm kind of glad you're leaving 
listen, this is just nuts. You got you to gotta try. And I know it's hard because I know people are hard. I'm hard. People are messy and I'm messy. But there are things you learn spiritually when you get into a group of people about how much you need to extend grace to others. And it doesn't take very long until you realize how much you need somebody else to extend grace to you. And, and that's, there are things you learn there that you're just not going to learn in here when you're not really getting involved in somebody else's life. We need to be uh, committed to one another in this. Our, our groups are where a lot of fellowship happens, where a lot of ministry happens, uh, where a lot of the, the core of our prayer ministry happens. And people are messy. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. But we're going to be a grace-filled community, and we're going to keep working on learning more about that. Three big on-ramps to uh, community here in our church. Attend the Sunday worship service. And this is a first step for a lot of people. Hey, I want to tell you something about our church that makes us different, too, in that connection with worship. We're a multi-generational ministry. And that makes us different than a lot of churches in our area. You look around you, you just see a lot of different kinds of folks. Now, you can, there, and there, again, right or wrong, this is just how we're approaching it, but there are churches that you walk in and everybody there, it's just, they, like they, they, they all got cut out of the same mold. They're all the same age. From, they're all dressed alike. They all, and that may be a senior adult crowd or it may be young adult crowd. But for us, we do multi-generational worship because I really have found that there's a lot of spiritual growth things and a lot of things that God does in my heart because I am in uh, a worship experience with children and with people my parents' age and with everybody in between and they're things we experience together in a multi-generational context that we're just not going to pick up if we're all the same age and in the same stage of life and going through the same things and we draw from one another in all those different areas and that's that's just how we felt God leading us to do it we're a multi-generational church and the worship service the connection part here is and again in our modern expressions of Christianity in our country, that me and God is off the charts. It's all about me and God. And, I de and, and ultimately, when you get into a me and God setting, you're defining what relationship to God looks like about 99% of the time. But when you get into the we and God, there's a whole lot of good things that start happening, that start right-sizing, where we get off base. There's somebody to help us stay focused, stay in... Stay in the core of what it means to be a part of the people of God. Not neglecting to gather together. Some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Serve others is another good on-ramp for community. Uh, I have found that the people that I know the best, that I, uh, and that know me the best in our church, are people where we have served side by side, shoulder to shoulder somewhere. Here or to the ends of the earth. You build relationships with people. And any of you who've ever been a part of a team, you're part of a sports team, or you're part of a band, or part of a club, some organization where there was a group of you moving in the same direction at the same time, you know what that's like, to, that shared experience, and how it, it puts you together forever. You always have that. And that's, that's what it means to serve the Lord together. And you develop a lot of relationship at a high level when when you do this together at, in the life of a church. And that develops a lot of community, not just in your groups out here, but in your groups during the week, in your groups far and wide. Just as each one has received a gift, use it to serve others as good stewards of the varied grace of God. And then uh, join, do join a group. That's, that's, where you, that's where you make friends. That's where you go through life together. Uh, I tell people in the membership class that if you're in the hospital for two or three days, there's a better than the average chance I'm going to come see you at the hospital. A lot of people say, I don't ever want to be so sick that Chad's the guy that comes to see me at the hospital. Uh, but I'm always amazed that when, when I make a hospital visit, I find, uh, I find the tracks of folks from First Baptist Church Allen have been there before me. They'll be there after me. They've been all over those caring for one another, doing those one another's at a really high level. Because but when you're in a group, that's how groups work, and that's what groups do. 
And again, everyone should not look out only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. And then commission for God's mission. Letter C. And we, we do believe in great commission living. Uh, we've been working on this in our missions committee uh, this, uh, oh, the last couple of years. We're kind of defining and refining this. Uh, there are a lot of things that a church can do. There are thousands of things churches can do. And we want to care for the poor. And we're going to do that. Care for the sick. We're going to care for the far and wide needs of the world. But there are a lot of things that somebody who doesn't care about Jesus or know Jesus will do the exact same things. And so if we're going to do those things, we're always going to take Jesus with us. So that's, that's our commitment. Because man, I, care, I care about people who are hungry and we want to feed people who are hungry. But the greatest need in their life is that they not spend eternity in hell, but they have a relationship to God through Jesus Christ. That's my greater burden. That's their greatest, that's everybody's greatest need. So it's not a either or, it is a both and, but we're not going to give up the and of the gospel in the things that we do and how we do it in the world. So we believe in great commission living. And everywhere we are, we want to talk about Jesus everywhere all the time. And we want to do that with our friends, and we want to do that with our neighbors, we want to do that with the people we work with, the people who are regularly in our circle of influence. We, we, we want to talk about Jesus there. We want, to take it, we want to take it across the street where you're going to have to cross a barrier of culture, of language, uh, of, of race, uh, socioeconomic background. We're, we're, going to, we're going to take it on everywhere and then to the ends of the earth. We've got to care about lost people everywhere because Jesus said that's where our mission goes everywhere to everyone we care about kingdom of God things and I want to tell you this so we're two years into this so I'll give you this touch with uh, our, our desire that there would be no place left in Allen Texas where people didn't have an opportunity to hear about Jesus and there are lots of numbers and all that stuff but here's how we started we, we said we, we want to see every person in our church be able to share a simple presentation of the gospel just, uh, we want everybody to be equipped to be able to do that. That wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you can be ready. When God opens a door, boy, now that was timing. My phone just fired. I heard two or three others. You know why? It's 10.02. Luke 10.2 says, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray the Lord of the harvest. Call out laborers for the harvest. Lord, make me one of those laborers today. Make us a church of laborers who go out to the harvest. Uh, that, uh, that, that's who we want to be. We've got to be equipped to share it. And not just as a, okay, we had a class on how to share your faith. Okay, we check that box. Now we can go on with our lives. But to be the ongoing part of who we are, to change our DNA and I'm amazed at how many people this has become a changed DNA and uh, at, at a really high level. We have, we have thousands of door knocks to approaching the, well, we're, we're awesome. We're closing on the 20,000 range in the next few weeks probably of uh, doors we've knocked on. Thousands and thousands where we have prayed with people. Thousands and thousands in our city where we have shared the gospel. Uh, and the cool thing, how God is pulling God's people together in a big way. So yesterday we had a we had a training opportunity, and I got to spend the whole day with a group of people uh, from uh, Glenn McDowell and I were at the same table uh, with a bunch of other people who weren't a part of our church. On this one, there were 25 churches represented at the training yesterday. 25 other churches. How about how cool is that? The body of Christ coming together for something as, as important as the gospel that uh, we had about 120 people going out into the community yesterday to talk to people about Jesus. We prayed with 95 homes yesterday. We shared the gospel. Everything it means to be a follower of Christ with 68 homes yesterday in our city. And four adults said yes to Jesus yesterday in our city. And that's just one day. If you show up at 3 o'clock, whether you've been through the training or not, if you show up at 3 o'clock today... You can go out and be a part of that today. You don't even have to say anything, but we need you to pray for the people who are saying something. Uh, that's, that's where God's at work in us and how God's using us. And, man, how cool to be a part of something so eternal and so big and to see God doing it so, uh, 
so powerfully. And that's the, that's the cold call. I mean, we're, we're saying, okay, we want to reach every home in our city by the end of 2020. You know, we're on track to do that. How incredible that is. Uh, join, join in that great adventure. And that's just that part. That doesn't count your family, your friends, people you work with, your neighbors. And we want to engage all of them too. But we're looking at God doing something big. The harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest will send out workers into the harvest. So we, we believe in faith in Christ. We want to belong in community. We're commissioned for mission, and that's just who we're going to be. Okay? Now, this little form, I want to explain this to you, what it means to be a member of our church. And uh, I hope you just give us the basic. Also, the folks in the office told me, this is a great time for me to tell you if your phone number has changed or your email address has changed, please update that for us right now. If we can do a big sweep like that, we can correct a lot. And we will not spam you to death, we promise. But if the email you continue to give us is the same one you give when you're registering to try to get a free hot tub at the state fair and you look at it once a year, give us one that you're actually going to see periodically. That would be really awesome. Uh, now, commitment to Christ. So we talked about what it means to have a relationship to Christ. We're saved by grace through faith. Today, would you like, I mean, you, without, I don't have to lead you in a prayer on that. You can just say, God, I know, I know that I'm broken. I know that I live in, I, I, I'm trapped in sin. Forgive me, please. I want to turn away from sin. I'm turning my life to Jesus. I'm putting all my faith in Jesus. Because I believe he died on the cross to pay for my sin and was raised from the dead. I want to follow him with all my heart for the rest of my life. I want to surrender my life to him. Uh, and as simple as that, your whole eternity can be turned around, transformed through Jesus Christ. And maybe you have done that. Maybe you'd like to talk some more about that. Make a note on that card right there. And if you've already made that commitment, that when and where, that's just one of my favorite things to ever look at. And I will look at every one of them because I love to see where God has worked, where he came to know Christ, all the different places and uh, Circumstances. Baptism. Have you been baptized by immersion? That means underwater after you commit your life to Christ. You know why we baptize that way? Because the Bible says baptism is a picture of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. So the only mode of baptism that preserves that image that the Bible says baptism is about is immersion. And that's why we do it, because of the what it demonstrates and what it pictures. It's a picture the Bible says. My sin has been washed away. And, and I want it all washed away. And immersion says it's all been washed away. Uh, and then that I have buried an old life. And I'm coming up because I have a new life because of Jesus in me. And uh, I want a whole new life. And so uh, because of those pictures, we, we ask. And so these are, the, these are the two core things about being a member of our church. Has there been a time in your life where you gave your life to Jesus Christ? You committed your life to him by grace through faith. And have you ever been baptized by immersion as a testimony to what Jesus did in your life? Not as a part of, uh, this doesn't save you. Baptism will get you good and wet in a Baptist church, but it's not going to save you. But it says, I have been saved, and I am following, ob obedient to what Jesus said to do. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I've done that. Uh, that's how you become a member. Those two things are the core of what it means to become a member. Now, to uh, being a member of the church, there are basic things that you do. I'm going to hit this really fast. Uh, those of you who've been a part of a booster club in uh, high school, those of you who have kids in a booster club, in one of, and my kids both went through Allen High School, and they're, we're part of booster club things. And uh, here's what they expected from me as a parent. Unbelievable. They expected me to attend their meetings. They expected me to give to whatever they were raising money for. They expected me to volunteer for whatever they were doing as a group. That's what they expected from me as a member of the Booster Club. You know what we expect from you at First Baptist Church Allen as a member? We expect you to attend, to give, and to serve. How about that? No more than the Booster Club at Allen High School does. Simple enough. I will tell you, my daughter got me into, got me into my daughter's here today, and she got me into uh, uh, the FFA Booster Club. 
And so I raised a couple of animals with her doing that. And uh, they expected that stuff. My son uh, got into Track Booster Club and then he shifted to, uh, to being, he was the eagle at Allen High School for his junior and senior year. And that got me in a different booster club. I get an email, congratulations, Mr. Suff, you're part of the cheerleader booster club. And that was, for two years, Rhonda was unavailable to go to booster club meetings. And me and a bunch of Texas cheer moms had a lot of good times together. Um, <laughs> If it wasn't for Gina Kelly sitting with me in some of those meetings, I couldn't have survived it. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that's, that's the basic bottom line of what we expect of members. Okay, so joining the church, here's how you do it. And those of you who are thinking about this, if you haven't done this officially, we don't just do it by osmosis. So if you haven't filled out a form of some kind, some of you, you say, uh, I'm transferring my membership from another Baptist church. So we transfer membership between Baptist churches. Now, there are Bible churches all over our area, and that's a different story I'll talk about in a minute. If you're transferring your membership, that means you're coming from, I moved here from Amarillo, First Baptist Church, Amarillo, Texas. And I'm a believer, I've been baptized. Okay, well, that's wonderful. And uh, you say, I want to join this church. So what we do is we fill out a little bitty form, and it says, hey, these people said they're a part of First Baptist Church, Amarillo, and they want to join us. In First Baptist Church, Allen, we send a little card up to Amarillo. Amarillo sends one back, says, well, you can have them. And that is how you transfer your membership. But see, it cleans up their records, and it gets ours official, and that's, that's how you transfer membership. So if you've come from another Baptist church, that's how you do that. Uh, if uh, and church name and the city, and we'll track down the address. You don't have to have all those details. Some people join by statement, and that means that you're coming from a church that Salvation by grace through faith. It's not by works. It's not, uh, it's not something that's fragile and you're going to lose it. And we can talk about those things depending on what that church is, where you come from. Because there are a lot of independent churches out there. We just need to have a conversation maybe. We're surrounded by Bible churches because we're in the shadow of Dallas Theological Seminary. We accept folks from those Bible churches who've been saved and baptized by immersion. We accept them by statement of that. There's no place to send it to. Then uh, for a lot of people, you've been coming here, you've made a commitment of your life to Christ. You came to Christ in another denomination. You came to Christ uh, through a college ministry years ago, somewhere else. And uh, so you've made a commitment of your life to Christ, but you've never been baptized by immersion as a testimony to that. And we ask that to be a member of our church, you do be baptized by immersion and to be a part of us and and so it's, it's not questioning your salvation. It's just saying uh, another opportunity to give testimony to it. To say, I affirm this church's uh, doctrinal statement in that particular area, which is core to us. I know a lot of people, you come from a non-Baptist background, you're baptized sprinkling as an infant, which is pretty awesome because it means you had parents who said, I'm going to raise my kids to know and love God and be a part of the church. And that's a great commitment for a parent to make. But that's just different than what we're doing with baptism, which is believer's baptism. Which is, it's not, it's not my, uh, what my parents committed to, it's what I committed to. It's my personal commitment to Christ. And then I am baptized a testimony to that personal commitment to Christ. So that's, that's just the difference in uh, how we approach that. And then if you'd like to speak to uh, one of our staff members about that commitment, well... Mark that. There's a box for that down there. If you're not a part of a group, uh, Ross would love to know about that so he can hook you up with a group real quick. Now, this is a whole lot of this commitment. The FBC, Faith in Christ, Belonging Community, Commission for a Mission, that's a big part of the invitation today. And wherever God is working in you in that, we're going to sing a song here. And we're not going to take real long. Maybe this is your commitment. Here's what we're going to do with these. I just need a couple of ushers at the back to, to pick these up. We won't, we won't go up and down the aisles this time, but as you're going out, it, just hand it to them if you have one. If you have a prayer request on there, just your name and a prayer request. We'll turn those in too. Or you can drop those at the welcome desk. You can drop them at the uh, Connection Center. I'm going to be at the Connection Center right out here a little bit to the left. If you have one of these and you're joining the church, here's the deal. You got to do one thing. So you're not having to walk down, stand in front of everybody even, because I'm a really gracious guy today. But you need to come back here and hand it to me and say, Chad, I want to join the church. And let me take your picture. And now here's what happens. You hand this to me, 
And somewhere between here, here, and there, you become a member of First Baptist Church Allen. Now, here's the deal. You may or may not feel a tingling sensation or a mighty rushing wind. But somewhere between here and there, that's when you become a member. And if you want to join today, you have one of these commitments you want to make. Be baptized. Be give your life to Christ. I want you to come back here. And there'll be me and a couple of other staff members back here. Hand us your card. Fair enough.